Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, we're going to be talking to Colleen Fall. She is an author, a mentor, and an advocate for parents with kids with special needs. She's going to be talking about how she got through finding out her daughter's special needs and how she navigated it and how she used her faith to help her get through it and how she became an advocate to other parents who have similar situations and need to get through it, just like she and her family did. So Colleen, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Great, sure. Well, you did such a good job introducing me. Like he said, my name is Colleen Fall. I am a wife and mother of two beautiful children one of whom has special needs. She's got actually a couple of pretty significant diagnoses. And when we first find we first started finding out about all of her uh, conditions, it came as a complete shock. We thought up until that day, we thought we had a healthy baby. And that was the beginning of a huge journey for me. And, and there were many facets to it that I never thought in a million years my life would head in that direction. So it's it's been very transformative. And somehow, (laughs) through God's plan, has led to me guesting on podcasts and, and writing a children's book and becoming a mentor to other parents with Uh, special needs children, especially those whose children are just being diagnosed. And this has all happened so fast. We only found out about our daughter roughly about a year and a half ago. So just so much has been, so much has happened in such a short time. And it has led me here to y'all. And I'm so happy to be here. I'm so blessed to be here and to be allowed to to just speak. And hopefully there's someone in your audience who needs to hear what we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. And we're definitely blessed to have you. Tell us about the special needs that your daughter has. You you know, explain to the listeners what what the diagnosis are and, and you know, uh what what they basically mean. Sure, absolutely. So when my daughter was about five months old, well, five months old is how old she was, she started doing she she was a very fussy baby for the first five months. And we didn't really, we thought we just had a fussy baby. We didn't really understand anything more than that. But when she got to be about five months old, she started regressing in some of her milestones that she had met. She had been slow to meet some of her milestones to begin with that we thought had to do with her vision, which didn't concern me too much because we have so many vision problems in our family. I figured she'd just need glasses when she got older. But uh, then she started regressing and not being able to do things like roll over. She stopped smiling. And that really concerned me. Um, And we ended up, she started doing these really weird arm motions where both of her arms would go from, you know, being at her side to all of a sudden shooting up above her head. And they looked at, my daughter's name is Grace. If you looked at Grace, when this would happen... You could tell that she herself was surprised by this and even upset by it. And I was like, she's never done that before. That doesn't look normal. I don't know what that is, but like, that's, that's strange. And my daughter was getting more and more upset by it. So I showed that I showed these motions to my mom who agreed with me that this wasn't normal. This isn't, this isn't something that's supposed that a child is supposed to be doing a five month old is supposed to be doing. And she would keep doing it over and over and over again. Like every few seconds, her arms would go up and we took her. So as soon as my mom saw this and kind of confirmed for me that, no, this isn't right. I grabbed my husband, I grabbed my daughter and we ran to the hospital and we went to the ER. And after being there for five or six hours, the hospital did blood panel and a chest x-ray 
and then came back to us and said, we can find anything wrong with her. Your daughter's probably just being fussy. Go home. And I think at that moment, I mean, it was like 11 o'clock at night. My daughter was finally asleep. We were tired. And they came and said, we couldn't find anything. Nothing's wrong. Go home. She's just being fussy. At that moment, I really wanted to believe that that was the case. I wanted to believe that I was just being overreactive and and an overprotective parent. I was like, okay, I'll wear that hat. That's fine. (laughs) As long as my child's okay, I'm okay with that. But then the next day, so, so we took her home that night. But then the next day, you know, just during the course of the day, I started texting some friends of mine. And, you know, telling them, oh, you you won't believe we went to the ER last night, you know, kind of just chatting. And I described these arm motions that my daughter was doing. And a friend of mine actually sent me a video of this same, these same arm motions that my daughter was doing. And it was another child doing it. And the title of the, of the video was called Infantile Spasms. And I didn't know what infantile spasms was, but I got on Google and I did a quick search and I I read enough to tell me that infantile spasms is a rare form of epilepsy found in young children and it is serious and it needs to be treated immediately and aggressively because it is very damaging to young children. And once I read that, I immediately got onto the phone with her pediatrician. And I, I told him, I think my daughter is having infantile spasms. She needs an EEG today. And she, because Google had told me the way to diagnose this was with an EEG. So I was saying she needs an EEG today. And at first, the people on, on the other line, they didn't quite take me as seriously as I knew I needed to be taking seriously. They, at first they tried to tell us, well, okay, um, you have kind of voiced concerns about her vision before we had already written a referral to you for you to see a neurologist at this other hospital. I forgot to mention this about a month before I had brought this up to my, to my doctor, her vision problems. And they said, okay, well, well, then I had asked for a referral to a neurologist about a month prior to this. But the other hosp- this other hospital, they referred me there in the hopes that I'd be seen sooner. But they, this other hospital has just been giving me the runaround for the last month. So fast forward to then, and I told, they said, you've already got a referral on file. Let's just keep your appointment at the other hospital. And I explained to them, you don't understand. I don't even have an appointment at the other hospital yet. They've been giving me the runaround for a month. I don't want to go there. She needs an EEG in Lafayette where I live today. And, and I just kept on saying that today, today, today. And they put me on hold for a little while. They came back and they said, okay, well, if you don't want to keep, if you don't want to just go to the other hospital, then we can put you on the roster here for the neurology department here at this hospital. But the nearest appointment we have is a month from now. And that's when I said, okay, darling, I hear what you are saying. And I understand what you are saying. Now I need you to hear and understand me. My daughter needs an EEG today. And I'm not getting off this phone until she has an appointment for today. And they put me on hold again at that point. And um, they came back after a little while. And they finally said, okay, Miss Fall." we can schedule her for an emergency EG tomorrow. Is that soon enough for you? And I said, okay, that'll, we, we will wait until tomorrow for her to be seen. And so that gave me about 24 hours to be on Google and, and looking up what infantile spasms was and everything I was finding out was just scary. So what I, what I learned was that it's basically it's like I said, it's a rare form of epilepsy and it happens in young children. And what it is, is your child is basically having hundreds of seizures a day, seconds apart. And that's, and, and all of those seizures are damaging for your children. And, and it's got a very wide spectrum of effectiveness in children. There's people who can get diagnosed quickly, who, you know, they're having infantile spasms and then they get on meds to stop the seizures. And then in three days, the, med- the seizures are gone. And then the kids grow up and they, they it's almost like it never happened. But then there's the opposite, very, very, uh, very, the opposite end of that spectrum where the kids are, are very, very deeply affected. They've got um, cognitive and, and mental retardation and cognitive delays, developmental delays, 
you know, just just very deeply, deeply, very, very drastically affected uh, lives because of having this inf- these infantile spasms as children. And so I am scared out of my mind at that point. And I, so we finally took her the next day to the, to the hospital for her EEG appointment. And I am just praying the entire time that I'm wrong. And they hook her up to this EEG machine, which for those of you in the audience who have never had an EEG, don't know how it works. Basically they have to attach like 30 wires to my daughter's head with paste. (laughs) And she's a fussy five month old. She's having none of it. She's, she was not happy about that process at all. So, but to get, they needed her after putting all these wires on her head, then they needed her to be calm and they wanted her to fall asleep. So my job was to sit on this bed and hold her still so that she would fall asleep. So I'm basically, imagine if you will, I'm basically immobilized holding my daughter laying down on this hospital bed in this semi-dark room. And it's me holding my daughter and this one other EEG technician lady who is in the room. And she turns on the machine. And after about 30 seconds of the machine being on, she's looking at this screen and she's looking at it. And all of a sudden she picks up her phone and she starts texting like crazy. And I could tell, I could tell that her entire body language, her entire body, yeah, her position, everything had, had shifted. And I asked her, is everything okay? And she puts down her phone And I found out later she was texting the neurologist, the main neurologist at the hospital. Um, She puts her phone down and she looks at me. And this is, again, this is like 30 seconds after the machine has been turned on. Uh, She looks at me and she says, I am not the neurologist and I am not qualified to make a diagnosis. So I should not be telling you this. However, I know that if that was my daughter on that bed, I would want to know your daughter has infantile spasms. And it just like in that moment, just felt like this entire mountain of bricks just fell on top of me. And I just started crying there on the hospital bed because I was so scared of what this was going to mean for her. And it's all my worst fears coming true. And so the neurologist then immediately admits us back to the emergency room. And we ended up staying in the hospital for three days. And during that time, they did so many tests, so many different kinds of tests. It was it was overwhelming. But one of the tests that they did was an MRI of her brain. And the results from that ended up revealing, they ended up coming back and saying to us, your daughter's MRI of her brain revealed that her brain does not look typical. And we think she has another condition that is a a genetic disorder called tuberous sclerosis complex. And again, I had never heard of that either. So so I got on Google again and I, and basically what Google told me was tuberous sclerosis complex is an even more rare genetic disorder, more rare than than infantile spasms. It's It's a rare genetic disorder where basically the, the TSC gene, the, the, the gene in, my daughter's DNA that is responsible for regulating cellular growth has a mutation on it and is therefore not functioning properly. And what it ends up resulting in is there are tubers. Her body is grows these random growths of cells that take the form of non-cancerous benign tubers that can show up literally anywhere in her body. They can show up in her brain, in her eyes, on her skin, on any of her vital organs. They can show up anywhere. And they, the, the cells, the growths themselves, the tubers themselves are non-cancerous. So they're not dangerous in and of themselves, but depending on where they decide to show up and how many there are and how big they decide to grow, they can cause some very, very serious health problems. And again, there's a very wide, there's a very broad spectrum of Effectiveness for tuberous sclerosis complex as well. There's people who grow up to be fully functional adults, never knowing they have it, but then they start growing these, what they think is acne on their skin, on their face, and they can't get it to go away. So they go into a dermatologist and they find out, oh, wait, that's not acne. Those are tubers on your skin and you have tuberous sclerosis complex. And otherwise they never would have known. But then there's another 
the, the other side of that. And there's people who are very, very drastically, seriously affected by tuberous sclerosis complex, very, and it often comes with a lot of other complicating conditions that in, you know, a lot of developmental delays and, and just the results, the, the possible results were terrifying of what could happen to my daughter. And so she, so we find out during that hospital stay that she has infantile spasms and tuberous sclerosis complex. And she also ended up, we found out she has two holes in her heart on top of that. And uh, was just very, very, it was all terrifying, you know, as a mom, uh, you know, this is, she turned six months old while we were in the hospital. My six month old daughter, she is just so little. And, you know, you're just terrified for your baby. You don't know what's going to happen to her. All of a sudden, all of these little things that parents kind of just take for granted that their kids are going to be able to do one day, things like sitting up and learning to walk and and learning to, to eat solid foods and feed themselves, learning to talk, you know, let alone growing up, going to school, getting married one day, you know, all these things we could not, in, in a day, we found out we couldn't take any of that for granted anymore. We was not a guarantee that our daughter was going to learn to talk or to feed herself or, or to grow up and have a career one day. It's not, we don't know. We couldn't figure out. We didn't know if she'd ever walk. We didn't know anything. And it was very, very scary. Um, I can easily say that that was the scariest thing I have ever experienced as a mother. And Fast forward a year, a year later, just about a month ago, actually, my daughter has also been now diagnosed with autism on top of that. So she's got three <laughs> pretty serious conditions. And we even had a, we were wondering, we thankfully, we got the results finding out that this was negative, but we were thinking she also had a second genetic disorder called polycystic kidney disease which is, it is very, it's, it's common. Well, not common, about 2% of people with tuberous sclerosis complex also end up having polycystic kidney disease. And that is basically where your kidneys start growing these fluid filled sacs or cysts on top of their kidneys. And it can lead to all kinds of health complications as well and cause your kidneys to, to grow and become enlarged and can cause kidney complications and failures. But so because she has a lot of, of these tubers on her kidneys. And so we were thinking she might have um, PKD. And but thankfully, we got test results that back for that very, very recently and found out that she didn't. But that was another thing on our plate. So uh, there's she's got my daughter has a lot going on. Now, that's the scary part of it all. And that was really, really hard for me. I've said this. I've said this now a couple of times. That was extremely terrifying and scary for me as a mom. And it wasn't just that my daughter was sick. It wasn't just that we had so much directly in front of us that we had to deal with to take care of our child. We had to get her onto medicine to get the seizures under control. That was the first thing that we had to do. But on top of that, as a little bit of time went on and I started processing what was going on, I realized my entire vision and understanding of how my my daughter's future was going to go was completely gone. All these hopes and dreams I had for her future, they were in a day, they, they had been taken away. Like, I have no idea what her future is going to look like now. And I started going through a very real, what I can only describe as a grieving process, maybe not for grief of a death, but grief of a life not lived, if that makes sense. I started grieving and I went through every stage of, of the grieving process, you know, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, you know, all that, all of it, all five stages. And it was very intense and it was very difficult because I was dealing with that emotional hurdle that I was, that I was handling, that I was trying to handle while also simultaneously trying to care for my daughter. And try to try to be there for the rest of my family. I have two children, and my son was was not even two years old at the time. He he was you know I have, I have two very young children, and you know my husband. Thank God I had my husband there with me, and he and I really pulled together as a team. Thank goodness. Um, and 
we were there to support each other. I don't think I would have gotten through that whole uh, time in our lives without my husband there. And I also turned to my faith because that was all I really like. <laughs> uh, like, I've been very blessed to have a very strong faith life. I'm a very faithful person. And so I turned to God and I was started praying and I started having some very, very honest conversations with God about what, <laughs> what he was doing with my daughter. <laughs> like, you know, that kind of gives you an idea of where I was at the time. Like it was just, what was happening? What was his plan for us? And what, what was he doing? And what was he asking of me? And it was very, it was very, it, it, it was a rocky road. It was very rocky road. And I, and I had all of these fears and anxieties about, you know, do I even, am I even capable of caring for my daughter and being the parent she needs? Because she's got a lot of special needs and I'm expected to be the one to fill those needs. And I don't know if I have what it takes for this job and, you know, praying about that and praying that for her future and, and what she's going to, you know, what skills are she going to be able to learn? Is she going to be able to talk? Is she going to be able like, just praying that she grow and blossom and it was just, it was really, <laughs> it was intense and just had a lot of fears and a lot of anxieties. And I questioned a lot of what God was asking of me. And somehow in the midst of all of that, in the, in the, in this cloud of the storm that I was in, all this chaos that I was in, somehow this, like this random thing, I got inspired to write a children's book in all of this. It was like, I mean, of all the random things, I literally woke up in the middle of the night one night with the idea for right for the story for this children's book. And I got up and I, I just started writing. It was at like four in the morning. I just started typing and I, uh, I ended up typing for hours and I finished the first draft and then I went back to bed and then I came back a few hours later and I read the story that I had, that I, I knew I had typed it up. I had written it. But I read it and it was like someone else had written it. And I think it was honestly divinely inspired because I didn't come up with any of the stuff that's in there. Um, I, I and, and what it is, is it's the story of a mom and a dad who find out that their children, sorry, that their child, their daughter has is going to be a very special child and has is, is going to have needs that most other kids don't have. And it ended up being called God's precious gift, a special needs child. And what happens is the mom and the dad are very worried when they find out from the doctors that their child is going to be special and they start praying and they ask God and they're praying, you know, God, please just, just fix our baby. Just, just fix her because I don't want this for her. And Jesus in the book shows up and he has a conversation with the mom and dad. And it starts off with, with Jesus saying to the mom and dad, fix your baby. But she is already exactly the way I chose to create her. And that begins a conversation between Jesus and the parents where he asks them, do you think that I make mistakes? And the answer is no, no, God doesn't make mistakes. And he has deliberately, intentionally given this specific child to these parents, not as a punishment, not as an oversight or as a burden, but as a gift. She's been given to them as a precious gift that he wouldn't trust to many other people. He gave them, he gave her specifically to them because he trusts them and because they are the exact parents that this child is going to need to be in her life, to care for her. And he has over, and he has known that they are, he, God has known that this child was going to be theirs for the parents' entire lives. And he has been preparing them for this moment for their entire lives. And he has already given them all the graces that they need for this task. And yes, it's going to be difficult, but that's only going to make the good times even greater because suddenly all of these little victories that most other people see as small things, they suddenly become huge, huge celebrations and they're wonderful. And there's going to, and what great times they're going to have because of that. And in addition to that, the book emphasizes that this child is already so incredibly deeply loved 
by God. He has, he loves her even more than the parents do. And that is, that is a huge amount. And he loves, he loves the child. He loves the parents and he has allowed all of this to happen out of love. And this child is going to be an avenue of God's grace to the parents and everyone else around them. He, she is going to be an avenue of grace to, to love uh, to love her and to care for her you know like it says in the bible when you care for one of these least of one of the least of these you are caring for me and and that's what she is going to be that's how she's that is how she's going to be a gift she is going to be an encounter with god for everyone she everyone whose life she touches and that is how, and she is going to be caring for her is going to be a path for heaven path to heaven for her parents and for everyone else she everyone else whose life she's in and it's it's this beautiful story i mean i'm biased but i, I think it's a beautiful story and it was and this book spoke so directly to my own fears and anxieties and the prayers that i was bringing to to god in my own prayer life it spoke directly to them i really think that god inspired me to write this book as an answer to my own prayers. And it was in writing this book and publishing it. It's available on Amazon, by the way, and on my website, godspreciousgift.com. It's available there. It's been published now. And it was through writing it and getting it illustrated and publishing it. It was that whole process of creating this book was so therapeutic for me. And it was, it was healing. It was very, very healing, and it changed my entire perspective of the situation that we now found ourselves in, that God has allowed to be our lives. And I started, um, I started growing in my faith life again, and just, and just trusting, learning to trust, and finding. I suddenly started seeing little miracles everywhere where God was, that He had little, little mountains that He had moved for her, and I have continued to see progress in my daughter we've gotten her seizures under control and she has started to move forward in her development she's still on her own path and she's still on her own timeline but she she has blossomed she's blossomed and that has been such a huge gift and somehow kind of just through this you know unplanned grassroots movement um <laughs> through writing the book and through people reading this book and then reaching out to me, I have somehow become a mentor for other parents who find themselves in similar situations for adults whose, whose children are getting diagnosed with these special needs. And it really is, it has been a privilege to be able to mentor parents through this because it's, it's a you need community in that when you're in that time and, and just always it takes a village, but you really need community. And from myself, we didn't have anyone in our particular, we didn't have any, any other people in our immediate community who was in any kind of a similar situation. So we felt very isolated. But somehow through this book, it has brought a community to us. Other families with special needs situations have, and disability situations have reached out to us and we have somehow formed a community and somehow I have been privileged to mentor other parents through this. And I, and that has been healing and, and helpful for them, but also healing for me as well through that. And never would have, never would have thought that that would happen before a year and a half ago. And that would, and it's just amazing to see how many different ways that God has, has moved in our lives in a positive way as a result of what I at first thought was the worst thing that could ever happen to us. So that, <laughs> that's my very long-winded story of just how I got here to answer your question, Curtis. That's, that's my story of how all of this, how all of this came about. And it's been an incredible journey and it's been transformative and it's been enlightening and it's been difficult, but beautiful. And I'm here today because of it, and I'm and I'm so thankful for it. Well, yeah. So yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's this it. Story <laughs> is definitely amazing, and you definitely answered a lot of my questions. So we got like <laughs> about fifteen minutes left. So 
Tell the listeners how you managed to effectively advocate for your daughter with the doctors, because I'm sure you've had to do a lot of advocating. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you remember at the beginning of my story, uh, when we first brought Gracie to the hospital, they they didn't think that anything was wrong with her. And I think at that point in my life, I was in the mentality of you know, the doctors have gone to school for a very, very long time. They are medical professionals. They know what they're talking about. And I don't, (laughs) I don't know what I'm talking. I don't know what I'm looking at. I just know, I just have this gut feeling that something is wrong. I know my child and I know that something is wrong. And, and I didn't know what was wrong exactly, but I knew something was off and they sent us home. And they told us she was being fussy, which, like I said, I wanted to believe, but I still had this lingering gut feeling. And so then the next day, when I saw this video, like that was, and I saw, I think I just needed a little bit of concrete evidence that, okay, this, no, this is clearly something wrong. And that was my first step in becoming an advocate because I got on the phone and they tried to tell me to wait. They tried to tell me, oh, I'm sure she's fine. There's probably nothing really going on. They they didn't take me seriously. And I basically had to tell them, not not yelling, not cursing or being in any way belligerent, but I finally got to the point where I just had to say, "I, I understand what you're saying. And I hear what you're saying. Now I need you to understand me. My daughter needs an EEG today, and I'm not getting off this phone until she does. And that was my first step. In, in learning to become an advocate. And I basically had to become a um, bear. And I've never done that before. I had never done that before or, or taken that kind of attitude with anyone uh, before. It was very, very new to me. But with the motivation of, I had learned enough in my little five minute Google search that this was serious and it needed to be taken care of. And um, like, so that was my motivation. And I, and that, that was just how it all began. And since then I've been able to process it and learn it, learn a little bit more. And basically to any of your, of your listeners who may be wondering, how can I better advocate for my child? The biggest thing is to trust your instincts because here's, here's what I've learned. They, yes, doctors and and other medical professionals. Yes. They went to school. Yes. They, they know a lot of other things than you do, but they are not the experts on your child. You are the experts. You are the expert on your child. And that makes you the most important expert in the room. Your, if your gut is telling you that something is off with your child, then listen to it because that is a grace. This is something that I have, have kind of figured out. I think that God gives... And Tying my faith into this. I think that God gives parents a very, very special and unique kind of grace to be parents, to be the parents of children, of the children he gives them. He equips them with with instincts and with attention to detail that everyone else, because they are not that child's parent, doesn't have. And so this was the thing that that I had to kind of figure out was that when I was showing, cause, cause I didn't direct, I didn't, I didn't share this in my story earlier, but at the beginning I had showed my daughter's arm movements to a couple of other people and they didn't really take it too seriously. They didn't think too much of it. And, and it wasn't until I got to my mom who was also a mother, she's my mom. And she was like, no, something's very wrong. So, uh, but I knew that something was wrong. And so I kept on showing it to people until I got someone who kind of agreed with me. But it's not like the big thing is to know that you're not crazy as a parent. It's not that you're seeing things that aren't there that other that and no one else is seeing it because they're not there. It's because no one else has the grace to see what you're seeing. It's that you can see it and they can't. So if you're noticing something about your child that is making you feel uneasy and worried, voice that talk to your doctors and and tell them, I don't know what's going on, but I know something is off and I need you to really look into this. And also something I have learned is that, I mean, always 
prior to this entire experience, I always kind of felt like, again, the doctors are the ones who know what to do. So whatever they say we should do, I trust them. And let's, let's just go with what they say. So I always kind of felt like the doctor was the one eating the ship on that. But then what I realized was, no, that's not how it goes. The doctor is not in charge in this scenario. I am in charge. The doctor's job is to be there to analyze and advise. But ultimately, the one calling the shots is the parent. So whenever a doctor comes to you and says, okay, well, I'm going to do this. The parent has every right to say, no, I don't agree with that approach. And I'd like you to look deeper into, into this other thing that still has me worried. And if you don't, and if they refuse to do that, you are welcome to say, well, then I'd like to seek a second opinion. Like that is, that is okay. That is perfectly okay. And it's very, and I've, I've spoken to so many other parents who are still in this kind of timid mentality of, of not being bold in speaking with their doctors. And I have done my best to encourage them as much as I can whenever I've encountered these parents that no, the doctors don't know everything. They are human and they are very, very busy and they are not experts on your child and they will miss things. They can they can miss things. So if you're still feeling uneasy about something, voice that and take steps to make sure that those concerns are taken seriously and leave no rock unturned, leave no stone unturned. And that has been, I have, I have been, I mean, I guess not surprised because I was in this same boat. So it makes sense to me, but I have been, um, a, a for lack of a better word, surprised by how many parents I've encountered. And it's like, there's, there's a, <laughs> there's this great divide. You're either, uh, you're either all, there's not really a middle ground here. You're either very timid on how you behave with the doctors thinking that they're the ones who, who should be deciding what happens, or you've got the mama bears and the papa bears who are like, no, that's not how we're doing this. And like, if, if you don't want me to bring her in, I'm going to bring her in anyway. Like it's very, very, very strong, um, you know, bowls really. And it's, those are parent, the, those parents are wonderful to work with, but, and I've basically worked really hard to help the people on the other side of this fence to come over and to encourage them. No, really, you need to, you need to advocate and voice your problem, voice your, your concerns to your doctors. and. And even, and it doesn't even have to be working with your book or sorry, working with your, it doesn't even have to be like, you know, I think, I think you've got the wrong diagnosis. It could be, this isn't going fast enough. My child is still suffering and you haven't put her, her next appointment is in like a month and a half. No, this needs to be sooner. And you can call them. Do not underestimate the squeaky wheel. The squeaky wheel is a very powerful mechanism. <laughs> like just call, just call them constantly. And they will, and just to be, it's funny, just to be rid of you, they will help you. <laughs> and like, and then I'm not saying, I'm not saying in any way to be disrespectful or unkind. People are just there trying to do their jobs and it's, and they're doing it to the best of their ability. But, you know, it's very important to be a powerhouse for your child, because if you're not going to speak for your child, no one will. If you're not going to fight for your child. No one will, because they can't fight for themselves. So that is your that is that is our task as parents is to fight for our children, to care for our children, and to trust the instincts that God gave us to be their parents. And it's it's been empowering to see parents kind of take take that journey and to see them kind of grow in that. It's usually pretty uncomfortable at first. It was kind of uncomfortable for me, but you kind of <laughs> it doesn't take long to kind of get comfortable on that skin, which is kind of fun. But, you know, it's important to ask your doctors questions and to say, okay, like, why are we taking this? Why are we taking this approach? Why? What is your reasoning? Are there alternatives? Are what is the latest research on on this on this method of treatment? Like, it's important to ask questions like that and to not just take the doctor's first first recommendation. It's okay to question and it's okay to do your own research. Do not underestimate a motivated parent with access to the internet. 
Like I have done so much research that I have brought to my doctor that she had never seen before, had not been up to date on. And it was with that, that we were able to craft a new, new treatment plan. And I do not assume that your doctors are up to date on the latest research on something. And if you have some, if you as a parent are wanting to do research on alternative, alternative methods of treatment that you want to try, bring that up to them. And that honestly, the most effective way that doctors are brought up, up to date on new method on, on new research or methods of treatment is through the parents who advocate. So you are a source of information for your doctor. So um and and they and they will listen. Doctors are good people. Doctors and they are genuinely trying to be there as a as a, a force of healing in the world. Like good people. They're not adversaries to work against, but people to to be, to be on your team to the best of their ability. I don't in any way want to communicate that doctors are in any way enemy or or people to in any way be working against but just people to 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 work with you in the best way possible so yeah that's that's <laughs> and and so that's kind of how i have been it's been very grassroots you asked how this has come about it's been grassroots it started with me publishing my book and then parents reaching out to me as the author of this somehow at first saying, Hey, I love the book. Thank you so much. This has been so wonderful read. It's touched my heart. It's touched my child's heart. It's been wonderful. Uh, just with great reviews. And then somehow we've ended up staying in communication. And that led to like, a lot of them will share, like my child just got diagnosed with this or that or the other. And we'll, and, and we've communicated about that. And we would, I would ask them if I could pray with them. And then we just, and, and then we just start talking about their, their child's condition and their in their case and somehow I just ended up becoming a mentor. It's and and I would encourage them to advocate for their children for their children. And it's it's been uh somehow like you know God has been moving. The Holy Spirit has been moving. He's been putting these people in my life and me and theirs and it's been a beautiful thing. It's it's just amazing how God works in all of that. Absolutely. <laughs> And we have run out of time for this episode, but before oh. we go, I would like for you to give out your website so people can get your book and if they need that advocacy or need to reach out to you, mm -hmm. they can. So close us out with the website. Absolutely. My website is www.godspreciousgift.com. You can contact me there. You can buy my book there. You can also buy the new coloring companion book that has just been published. You can buy these books on Amazon as well, but it's called God's Precious Gift, A Special Needs Child is the name of my book, and God's Precious Gift, A Companion Coloring Book is the name of my coloring book, and you can get all of that on my website, www.godspreciousgift.com. Godspreciousgift.com, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Colleen is definitely God's precious gift to those who need her advocacy. So if you know of anybody that needs mm -hmm. Colleen's help, needs to learn how to get on the road to advocacy for special needs kids, be sure to follow, rate, review, share this episode mm -hmm. to them. And if you have any mm -hmm. guests or suggestion top topics, see Jackson102 at Cox.net. Once again, God's precious gift.com. Colleen, thank you so much for sharing your amazing story. You're an amazing woman and you show a lot of strength and keep doing what you're doing and help and others find their strength. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure being here. <laughs> for more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.